welcome to the newest episode of From the Horse's Mouth. We're here to talk about some running shoes. By the way, these are some of the best trail running shoes. Now, I'm not sponsored or endorsed by New Balance, but if they're looking for any mediocre runners out there that have a lot of running knowledge, hook me up. Yeah. So we're here to talk about running shoes. And as always, From the Horse's Mouth is here to maybe bust some myths, burst some bubbles, uh, bring some new ideals to the table. Definitely not saying this is the only way it is. This is just what we think may be the best or the closest to the best way to present this current information. So about two months ago, I was going to do a clinic called 99 Problems But a Shoe Ain't One. One of those problems was a tornado that made us cancel the clinic. Wasn't able to do the clinic. I'm hoping to be able to do that clinic maybe mid-June, so look for that coming on our website and through social media. In that clinic, I was going to talk about some of the common misconceptions of running shoes, uh, for example, how they running shoes are marketed as kind of the savior for certain injuries, uh, being able to control motion. We've all heard of the dreaded pronation. That's going to be my next Halloween costume. I'm going to be pronation. Uh, come after some people and make sure they get Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis. Uh, so yeah, look for that too. Uh, but basically, what I want to talk about today is, we get a lot of people that come in and say, what's the running shoe for me? And then they expect me to watch them walk, maybe even watch them run. We want to look at wear patterns on the shoe. And then I go over in the corner and I pull the curtain and I get my Wizard of Oz voice on and then I say, you shall have motion control shoes. So I do gait analysis on almost every one of my runners. I do a video analysis on a natural surface, not on a treadmill. That's a whole nother from the horse's mouth. Maybe that'll be a from the horse's episode, but we'll, we'll see about that one. Um, but we do a gait analysis out on the road because I want to see if my movement analysis in here in the clinic matches what's happening out on the, on the road. A lot of the times I can make a very well um, established guess at how they're going to run, but sometimes I, you know, it doesn't match and that's what I need to see, especially as I go through rehab. But when that person finally says, well, what's the best shoe for me? The best answer, and it's not my answer, this is coming from one of the largest studies done by the US military through the army on how to fit a shoe, what criteria we should use, basically boiled down to just comfort. So if the shoe was comfortable, comfortable, it was the shoe for you. So other than that, nothing else mattered. If we were trying to match a certain gait pattern to a shoe, a, a certain foot, flat foot, a uh, high arch foot to a certain shoe, None of that matched up as far as injury rates, comfort, anything like that. Some other studies done by Wynn and Nig et al. Those studies actually looked at, can we take a shoe that's a motion control or stability shoe and actually do what the shoe is designed to do? Control motion or stabilize the lower extremity. They didn't do that at all. So we would put somebody that was an overpronator, which is just a hell of a term out there that's, uh, if anything, it's more of a, it's a fear-mongering term. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with that, but overpronation, it can occur. Is it the end-all be-all? Research would also say that overpronation in itself is not a predictor of running injury. So you do with that information what you want. Uh, but back to the other research, when we put runners, both elite runners, your mediocre runner and beginning runners, in shoes that we thought were going to control or help them with their, their disadvantage over pronation or you know, if they needed to help bolster a high arch, what we found is no change in the mechanics of the body. And when we would put people on force plates in these different shoes, the impact forces on the body didn't change, just at the shoe. Now what was happening here? That doesn't mean that different shoes don't affect people but what's changing is, is your body's adaptation to the ground through the shoe. So if I take somebody who is, let's say an overpronator, and I put them in a stability or motion control shoe, and now I dampen the body's ability to react to the ground, I may have made the problem worse. So again, go back to the criteria of the Army study. All shoe fitting, for the most part, should be looked at from the, the uh, criteria of comfort. Another big thing is actually how we measure the foot. Most people are in a shoe that's almost a size too small, sometimes a size and a half. 
And a lot of it has to do with foot width, especially as we age, the tendons and ligaments, they go under what's called creep or hysteresis. We're gonna have a wider, fatter foot. So the old fat foot when we get old is a true thing. Um, so that the width of your foot is gonna matter. And usually when you walk into your normal running store, they're not gonna have a variety of widths. So we just say, ooh, that one's pretty and it feels pretty good. And then we go out and run and all of a sudden we start having issues. And that is one of the few times where you may be able to blame a shoe on an injury, which is the other you know, side of the coin. Well, my shoe, I think it caused Achilles tendonitis. I think it caused this. Uh, I, I correlate this to a, a guy that I look up to, Jason Glass, follow him on social media. He's a strength conditioning coach in Canada. Um, showed a picture of one of those contraptions that his son built to protect an egg where you drop it from a set height. Contraption falls. The whole goal is not to break the egg. So if we were really to break that down and think about it, did you like my pun? Break it now. Uh, to really think about it, we wouldn't be building a contraption to put the egg in, we would change the egg. So I'd hard boil that damn egg so it didn't break and now I've got a, a better chance of winning the, the competition. So why do I think I'm gonna put a broken body in a $120, $130, $140 pair of shoes and be able to change the mechanics of a machine that is so highly complicated, we don't even have it figured out yet, but lo and behold, some shoe that looks like a clown out of the Simpsons made it up is gonna con you know, control the motion of my foot. I have no clue. But that's what's being marketed out there and that is a big driver for the shoe companies. Nothing wrong with it, but there's a lot of money in this industry. So we would hope that in something like sports and athletics and running, which has over, in the US alone last year, 30 million runners. 50% of those 30 million had an injury of some sort. So it's a big deal. So if I'm going to go after some market that is wanting to continue a sport, I'm going to go after the one with the most people in it and the most injury or the highest injury rate. So now we start to go for the easy fix, right? We say, well, shoot, that's hard work to go in there and do um, some corrective exercise, rehab, do whatever. It is really easy to go look online or go into a running shoe store and say, what's going to help me with my shin splints? Now, do we get lucky every once in a while? Absolutely. But I always think we should start with the function of the body first. We should fix that egg, then put it into a shoe that is comfortable. And then from there, if we have any other issues. So let's say, let's say I have somebody, and this is just a hypothesis of my own. Let's say I have somebody that's very, very mobile. So they're able to stretch and flex and they can palm the floor, always riding on their ligaments and tendons. So. Should that person be in a motion control shoe because they're overpronated, which if you're very mobile is usually what we're gonna find? I don't think so. Because that motion control shoe now acts like a jackhammer, not allowing them to adapt to the street, the trail, whatever they're running on, and now they're not going to be able to adapt to that impact. And then flip side, take a really stiff person. We put them in a very a hard shoe. Let's put them in a stability shoe. Now the stiffness of their body doesn't have time to adapt. They're literally like a piece of concrete running down the road. So you can see, I'm not gonna say that shoes are gonna cure an injury, they're not going to cause an injury. They do play a role, I just think it's a much smaller role than we kinda, we put into the equation. So next time you go to a running shoe store, and this is, video is not meant to dog my friends that own running shoe stores, work in running shoe stores that are in that industry, that is a, a big industry for a reason, um, but you also gotta think back in the day, people used to run around on shoes that were nothing more than a piece of rubber and some cloth on top. It had nothing to do with motion control. We haven't gotten that much faster since those times either. So when we go in and we want this, oh, is it, that's time? Oh, time. message from our sponsor. Sorry, this video is brought to you by Hoka11. So if you're looking for a shoe that looks ugly and ridiculous and may cause an injury, Go get your Hoka 1-1s today. Okay, back to the video. So anyways, um, next time you go to a shoe store, make sure you look for something that's comfortable first. Measure the width and the length on a Brannock device. Actually, old school is still better, all the fancy scanners and everything. Brannock device is still the way to go. So that's that old school thing that slides around both ways, width and length. Get somebody that measures. Do you want somebody to look the way you walk? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not the end all be all. So if something's comfortable, it's the right size, go run in it, see how it feels. If you have an injury, maybe think about fixing the egg 
instead of putting the egg in a really fancy contraption and dropping it off a ledge. And please remember, I'm not telling you to jump off a building in your shoes and see if you're not going to get hurt. That is also not the goal of this video. I hope you learned something out of this rambling video about shoes. Basically, this is my little PSA and also kind of an infomercial for the, hopefully at an upcoming clinic on shoes. So that'll probably be mid-June. If you have any questions for me about this, you can email me at drbobeard at gmail.com, uh, at drbobeard on social media, chirofrom.com. And other than that, I'm always looking for ideas on from the horse's mouth videos, and we still got to name this guy. So shoot us some hashtags about names for whatever this guy is. See you guys next time.